Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, the Labour Party celebrated its victory in the Peterborough by-election after a close-fought contest with the Brexit Party. Labour hung on to the seat by just 683 votes, with the Conservatives coming in third. The new MP, Lisa Forbes, says her victory shows the public have rejected the politics of division. Now, Labour has managed to hold off a challenge from the Brexit party, narrowly hanging on to its Peterborough seat in yesterday's by-election. Lisa Forbes won by a margin of just 683 votes, with the Conservatives trailing in third place. Jeremy Corbyn called it a win for the politics of hope over the politics of fear. Roll up, roll up and fill your boots with a little bit of political analysis this morning. I, I have to tell you, I don't know whether or not you clocked this, but I can't remember the last time the bookies got something so wrong when it comes to the electoral behaviour of the British public. I heard the fellow from, I can't remember which bookmakers it was, but it doesn't matter, but I heard him on with Nick yesterday, and um, the Brexit party were absolute shoo-ins for this Peterborough by-election. And they came pretty close to winning, make, make no mistake. Um, it says something about British politics that a, an organisation with no members and no policies and led by an unelected racist liar can come very close to winning a seat in the House of Commons. I don't know quite what it says about British politics, but it would be foolish to ignore that lesson. Um, however, what lessons do you draw from this by-election? Labour won. There is no um, uh, mistaking that simple fact, but was it a glorious victory? A glorious victory. I do not know. 17% down, but the actual majority was up. It's not a traditional Labour seat. It, it was held by that lady who um, uh, had to resign after um, uh, driving offences, wasn't it? She was jailed for driving offences. Uh, so you've kind of, some people have suggested, because the lady that won in Peterborough had uh, done something on social media that, that was anti-Semitic. Whether or not she knew what she was doing is, I suppose, debatable, but of course some people are, are simply observing that Labour have replaced the criminal with the anti-Semite, whereas other people are pointing out that the left-wing racists beat the right-wing racists in the race to represent Peterborough. I don't know. I'm just telling you what's out there. I'm just telling you what's out there. Um, and, and just in reference to that anti-Semitism accusation against Labour's new Peterborough MP, she has stressed already that she believes all anti-Semitism is abhorrent, but she had liked a Facebook post that said Theresa May had a Zionist slave master's agenda. Um, she also endorsed a message that said Islamic extremists were created by the CIA and Mossad. Uh, it's not a good look. I, I mean, do you, do, the, the policing of social media is quite incredible. I, I use likes uh, as a bookmark. I once liked a tweet that was uh, on one of the sort of far-right websites, oddly, it but ended up in my feed, explaining why Ian Duncan Smith was a genius. I, I liked it because I thought whenever... Whenever I'm feeling low, whenever I find myself in times of trouble, it won't be Mother Mary that comes to me, it'll be my likes on Twitter, and I'll go back and read that, and I'll chuckle. The idea that Ian Duncan Smith is some sort of intellectual giant, I, I, it amused me hugely. But I took a shooing from all sorts of Jeremy Corbyn fans on Twitter for apparently only pretending to hold humanitarian values while secretly nursing a profound desire to see Ian Duncan Smith resume uh, the leadership of the Conservative Party. So I don't know that liking something is always evidence of endorsement, but on this occasion it seems certainly seems to be. But they won't take nothing away from them. They won as far as I understand it because of a very, very good ground campaign. Uh, I presume some people on the far right have already tried to blame it on Muslims. You don't even need to check anymore, do you? Uh, <laughs> I won't mention any names because I haven't got any uh, evidence in, in front of me yet, but we will uh, probably have to mention a couple before the... Uh before the end of the hour, uh, it, it, 683 votes. Mr Farage, of course, was there. Uh, he hid in a toilet, I'm told, as the result came in, um, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If you've got to hide somewhere, a toilet seems got locks on the door, hasn't it? Can't hide anywhere else. He was expecting to be doing a, a victory lap of honour, otherwise he wouldn't have turned up. Uh, but he hot-footed it for the, for the toilet <laughs> when it, it emerged that it was going to be quite an embarrassing evening for him. But hand on heart... And objectively, it, it, it's a better result for him than it is for Jeremy Corbyn. I, I know it's a bit odd to suggest that losing is actually winning, but 
to be leader of the Labour Party at a time of such epic disarray in government, that we've not seen anything like this except in the history books. It's an astonishing catalogue of chaos that the Conservatives are undergoing at the moment. And it's not over yet. And to, to see the leader of the opposition, or to see the major opposition party, lose nearly a fifth of its vote share... I mean, it's actually quite incredible. And then you throw in the results of the recent council elections and the results of the European elections. It, it, it's, well, it takes a great effort of will to see this as uh, a resounding endorsement of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. And then, of course, you've got all those Labour voters who, 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 like me in the past, have voted for the Labour Party despite the current leader. Not even the leadership, but despite the current leader. So that's a pretty unpleasant place to be politically at the moment, is if, if you vote Labour, Labour do, you vote Labour despite Jeremy Corbyn, Labour do well, you get told that your vote proves how popular Jeremy Corbyn is, despite the fact that your vote was actually cast while holding your nose about who leads the Labour Party. So where are we today? I, I, there's three and a half parties in this by-election that could realistically have got over the line. It's an astonishing result. Big surge for the Liberal Democrats again. I don't know what it says. It, it says, I think, that the Brexit... It's not really a party, this, this Brexit party. It doesn't have any policies. It doesn't have any members. I don't think that you can... I, I don't think... The leader has been in any way elected democratically. This is peak Brexit, isn't it? Taking back control and, and democracy by setting up a mysteriously funded organisation um, with, a, with a fella in charge who nobody voted for. Hasn't been elected under any recognisable rules or systems. And all of their candidates, presumably, were just chosen by individuals, not by members or voters or ballots or anything like that. It's the least democratic organisation that I think I've ever seen on a ballot in Britain. But that is Brexit, in a nutshell, claiming to be bringing back democracy while actually doing the opposite, as is evinced by Dominic Raab's latest intervention on the political stage. This is peak Brexit, I think you'll agree, claiming that the best way to restore parliamentary sovereignty is to completely abandon it in the style of Charles I. Brexit gonna Brexit. So what did you learn yesterday? I, I don't think I learned anything. I, I kind of learned that it, it, by-elections have more to do with what goes on on the ground during the campaign. There was a great story when UKIP got ahead of itself in a, in a by-election a few years ago, and they were pretty sure they were going to win that one as well. I can't remember which one it was, forgive me. But their, part of their confidence was built upon the fact that they didn't see any activists in town handing out leaflets. So they, they were trying to overthrow, I think, a Labour majority. And they were confident partly because um, they hadn't seen any Labour activists handing out leaflets in the town centre and they'd been doing loads. Which seems a fairly plausible conclusion to arrive at until it was pointed out that the Labour activists would have been doing research-led door-knocking. They'd have been out on the doorstep mobilising a vote based upon intelligence and research that went back years in the constituency. I'm not going to lie to you, I don't know enough about um, campaigning on the ground. I don't know enough about door-stepping and, and, and door-knocking, but I do know that, that that to me makes sense. So where are we? It seems fair to say that everyone persuaded that a kamikaze Brexit would somehow be a good idea. I don't know if you saw the candidate in Peterborough being interviewed by, by uh, Joe, uh, Ollie Dugmore, the political journalist over at Joe's, doing some astonishing work, formerly of this parish, actually. And he, he asked the candidate, was insisting, is he called Mike Green? He was insisting that the EU um, imposes rules on our education system. So... Ollie Dugmore just asked him for some examples. Provide an instance where the EU has insisted on something for our education system that we've then enacted on. No. I can look at the jobs. I looked at whether it's products. We talk about food. We could negotiate better prices if we had the whole world. If I look at medicines, they said that we were on about selling the NHS. That was never said. We said we should tender for products within the NHS, drugs, services. We could buy so much cheaper and say billions, but that was spun into saying we're selling the NHS. The NHS is not for sale. So education is affected by what we got to teach, how we got to teach, when we got to teach. 
NHS is affected by how we buy our drugs, how we buy our services, the prices we pay. Every area is affected by the EU, but, and I believe we're better without. But in the instance of education, it's the government in Westminster that sets the curriculum, it's the Department of Education, the EU... Within no European boundaries, EU boundaries. It was, okay, so what EU boundaries are there in the instance of education? It, it, it infiltrates every part of our, uh, of our business. I've probably got one more question, because okay. the guys are going over. Sure, it. sure, okay, so we'll, we'll just go again then. Specifically, in education, you're saying it infiltrates every part of our education system. Oh. How? It, it, well, in education... Uh, we are we are told what the, the the sort of hours that kids should go to school. We're given what how they should be fed in school. We're given what subjects they should do within school. We're increasingly being told how that is should be monitored, tested, uh, and and what exams they should do to, to some degree. But it's the, it's the national government that sets the curriculum, isn't it? You know, we're very compliant as a country. So what I see is that we comply with anything Europe, Europe says. If they suggest it, we tend to do it. Other countries tend to do their own thing and don't comply. And I think part of the problem is we're so compliant that if they suggest it, we do it. Could you provide an instance where the EU has insisted on something for our education system that we've then enacted on? No. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why, why doesn't every journalist do that? Specific examples, please. Specific examples, please. They didn't have any at all. Can't name one. In the same way that they can't name a single country with no trade agreement. Name me a country that is currently trading on exclusively so-called WTO terms, and they can't name one. So it's kind of scary on that level, but everyone who still thinks that that's what the country should do or what the country wants seems to be... What's the word I want? Not coalescing. Yeah, coalescing will do. Coalescing around the Brexit party. Do you think anyone who wants a kamikaze Brexit would have voted Labour or Conservative in Peterborough? I don't think they would have done. So it's a 61% leave constituency now reduced to about 30% in support of the only Brexit that seems in any way deliverable, the, the, the nightmare of a kamikaze Brexit. That suggests support for Brexit in its um, multiple meaning, in the, the Brexit that means a million different things to a million different people, that may now be disappearing over the horizon. That, that, that inevitable shakedown to no Brexit versus no deal seems to be crystallising, but of course there's only one party that is hoovering up one side of that vote. A lot of Labour voters still think Labour will, not least because uh, the Deputy Leader and many, many others have made it pretty clear that that's what they want to happen, will come out for a second referendum, and that opens the door to the possibility of of no Brexit. Um, doesn't guarantee it by any stretch of the imagination. So you've got about 30% of that electorate. Now, I, I would say, so I watch these things a little more closely than anyone should have to, I would say that about 15%, about half of that number, are actually comfortable with the sort of nasty agenda of some of the personnel associated with that party. You could sort of sum it up as the breaking point poster or, or, or the claim that people shouldn't speak foreign in public despite the fact that your own children speak foreign at home. That sort of racist, xenophobic, deceitful um, hypocrisy. Coupled with, of course, that phrase we learned yesterday, rhetorical inversion, when you accuse your political opponents of being exactly what you know you are very, very clever to do that because it, it, it diffuses the accusation. So Farage, no doubt, is marching around the studios this morning claiming that all the other politicians are actually liars, despite the fact that he is prepared to lie about something as serious as a, an assassination attempt. But it's clever. It's rhetorical inversion. So that works. But I think that's about half of the support. I think the other half still want no deal Brexit, but don't deserve to be filed under racist liars or people who are comfortable with racist liars. I could be wrong. I, you know, wouldn't be the first time. And that leaves the door wide open. What the hell should the Tories do now? It's hard to see the party surviving unless they get back the people who are currently voting for the Brexit party. And you could if you squinted. If you squinted and shielded yourself from the sun, you could just about make out an analysis here that suggests Corbyn's right to have tried to keep a foot in both camps in the context of yesterday's results, last night's results, not in the context of the European elections, of course, and the recent council elections, which is quite an astonishing achievement for me, really, because I've just spent 15 minutes saying, mm, I, I don't really know what's going on now. And the great thing about that is I can ask you to do a better job on 0345 6060 
three. Let's welcome John Curtis, our elections expert, to talk about the result in the Peterborough by-election last night. A good night for Labour. They held the seat. Yes, politically a good night for Labour. Cephalogically, very um, underwhelming. Uh, two points to make. The first is that at 31 per cent, the Labour, Labour Party's share of the vote is the lowest share of the vote ever won by a winning by-election candidate. Mm. And in truth, that's one, just but one of many indicators of the way in which our politics is now much more fragmented. Secondly, the performance, once you take into account what happened in the constituency two weeks ago in the European election, the outcome for Labour is perfectly consistent with the party's current average rating in national opinion polls, which is the grand total of 23%. I do not think that this is either evidence that the Labour Party is at the moment in a fit state to fight a general election, or indeed, as the Labour Party is trying to claim, evidence that somehow or another Brexit disappeared in the last two weeks in this, in this by-election. Basically, this is exactly what you would expect, given the impact of the European election and the Brexit legacy mm. on our national politics. Well, Jeremy Corbyn thinks otherwise in terms of being ready to fight a general election. Let's listen to him in Peterborough. Yesterday, the Labour Party came together on the streets of Peterborough. The Labour Party came together in this campaign and on the day that Theresa May ceases to be leader of the Conservative Party, my message is to all the squabbling contenders for the Tory party leadership, bring it on. We are ready for a general election at yeah! any time. Well, he says he's ready. John, what about the state of the parties in general as a result of the Peterborough Biden? Well, what we now have to realise is that we are now looking, for the time being at least, not at the classic Conservative Labour duopoly, but at a four-party system. Mm. Essentially, the polls are saying the Brexit Party are running at about 25, Labour has already said at about 23, with the Conservative Liberal Democrats, you know, 20% stroke high teens. And the result in Peterborough is exactly in line with those kinds of figures. And basically what we have now is a situation we have uh, the two traditional parties who, frankly, like uh, the Labour Party uh, uh, indicated last night, would much prefer to talk about issues of left and right mm. and find it very, very difficult to maintain unity on the question of Brexit, being now challenged from both ends of the spectrum by the two parties who are very happy to talk about Brexit, but who perhaps don't necessarily have a great deal to say about anything else, that is UKIP and the Liberal Democrats. Um, but those, all four of these parties, are at the moment serious contenders for power in a forthcoming general election. Now, of course, it then leaves open the question, will this last or not? And you can argue that the experience of previous European elections is that it won't, except that the cause of this change, Brexit, ain't going to disappear anytime soon. And that's a potential problem for the Labour Party. Yeah, Brexit, of course, has been a difficult topic. Um, Labour has some of the most remain seats and some of the most leave seats, and they've sort of struggled to come up with something that appeals... But the one thing that is clear, the Labour Party, although the Labour Party has the most remain and the most leave seats, the one thing that is blindingly obvious is that most of the Labour vote at the in level of individual voters comes from Remain voters. Yeah, Around 70% of it comes in that direction. And when you look at the losses that the Labour Party is currently suffering, either two weeks ago or hypothetically in the current polls, for every one vote the Labour Party is losing to Brexit, and it is losing some, it is losing three to the Liberal Democrats and the Greens. Did we actually learn anything last night, this, this result in Peterborough, which um, I, I, I suppose if you had to... Well, look, Labour won. The Brexit Party were widely expected to. The bookies had almost given up on any other result. Conservatives had a nightmare, although um, they came third, which is an improvement upon the recent electoral showings. And the Liberal Democrats, I think, had the biggest boost of all. Um, 90 minutes after 10 is the time. Well, what do you make of it all? I, I, I would suggest to you that we now see the Brexit party being the uh, rallying point for a kamikaze Brexit, blowing ourselves up in the hope of doing a little bit of damage to all those foreigners that we hate on the other side of the channel. No one has yet offered up the other poll to that position. Liberal Democrats are closest, but in the context of constituency by-elections, that's not going to wash. So what, what is this anything you've got, to be honest? John's in Oldham. John, what would you like to say? Hello there, James. Hello, Good to speak to you again. Good I night, spoke night. to you from Ljubljana last week. Yeah. Right, you go around, don't uh, you? Yeah, I don't I just. Um, yeah, I've just got this theory, and I know it's rather dangerous to put 
for or theories which are not proven to you is that <laughs> the uh, not today, know. mate. All we've got yeah. today is theories that are not proven. It's, uh, if it's a theory about a Lisbon Treaty that doesn't exist or Article Twenty Four oh, of yeah, GATT well, nonsense, that that's not yeah. proven. But you're all right on a bit of speculation. Yeah, trust me, I'm not going there. <laughs> um, yeah, the I believe that the um, uh, that we were actually done a favour, um, uh, me personally, um, by the fact that the American ambassador and Donald Trump both intervened this week and talked about the NHS. Mm. Now, I if I look at the figures last night, Labour did as badly as you could expect them to do. Uh, the Brexit party didn't do as well as people... They were considered to be a shoe in I mean, book- bookmakers don't lose money. Well, they did yesterday. So, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe that um, they were a shoe in until... Um, the ambassador and Trump opened their mouth about the NHS. And okay. as, soon as, that, uh, as soon as that happened, I believe that a number of Tory voters who would have voted, voted for the Brexit party all of a sudden saw uh, a big yellow flashing light in front of them and said, actually, that's not what we want. We actually don't want to sell off the NHS. And the Tory party... Or some of it, at least, hmm. appears not wanting to sell off the NHS or the component parts. I suppose if we were to indulge in a little bit of light conspiracy, we, we, we'd have to point out that after Donald Trump said that the NHS was on the table in a press conference in front of the world's cameras, um, yeah. Mr. Farage was squirrelled into the American embassy later that day, exactly. and the very and the very next day, Mr. Trump um, uh, was saying that the NHS wasn't on the table. So if we were to add t- weight to your theory, you, you could suggest that someone had said to Donald Trump, God, no, you can't do that yet. You get, you've got to backtrack on it. You can't do that exactly. yet. Crikey. Exactly. God, yeah. not even my yeah. fans are that stupid. We're not going to get this one past them. <laughs> Quick, get on the oh, telly. Well, get on the telly. Ring your mates. Ring your mate. Get on the telly and, and, and pretend that you're not after the NHS. And, and, and yeah. it was a little bit too late to swing the vote back, you, you would argue, in Peterborough. Uh- I would say that the Tory vote was actually slightly higher than had been the uh, expected um, from the uh, the European elections and the local elections. Well, they lost. Uh, they lost fifteen thousand votes. Oh yeah, uh, as, uh, but they weren't but, that far behind. I mean, you seven thousand two hundred and forty-three in third. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's quite a good showing. It's a twenty-five percent loss, but it was a Tory seat up until. It 2017, was wasn't it? It was Stuart Jackson. Exactly. It was one of these bellwether seats, wasn't it, really? Yes, where, still uh, is. It was because he, he won it from the Labour Party and then um, yeah. lost the it again. The majority at the last election was actually less than the majority that they got last night. In numbers it was, but in share yeah. they've gone off a cliff. Oh, so yeah, there's nothing exactly. here, is there, John? It's, 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 I, I like your argument. The NHS, I think, could prove to be the uh, fly in the ointment of of the Brexit party snake oil. Uh, It it does seem increasingly clear that there are many, many people associated with or... I mean, Farage is on the record as saying that he wants an insurance-based healthcare system. And, of course, he's also now known to have allegedly taken £450,000 from an insurance tycoon who's under investigation about uh, the sources of some of his money. I, I mean, you don't really have to be Sherlock Holmes to join those dots together. But yeah, all right, so that's our first takeaway. Number one, Woody Johnson, the American ambassador, and Donald Trump, the American president, uh, both uh, making it clear that they believed the NHS to be on the shopping list for any kamikaze Brexit, albeit that Donald Trump characteristically said the precise opposite within 24 hours. And that would explain why Farage's crew didn't quite get over the line. 24 minutes after 10, 03456060973 is the number that you need. Um, anything bigger picture than that? Do you think? Anything that, that, that reflects upon the national political stage? James is in Peterborough. That's appropriate, James. Um, what can you tell us? From the horse's mouth, as it were. Oh, it's Rob. Sorry, I was I was name-checking you, James, because you uh, helped me, um, hopefully, uh, dent the Brexit vote yesterday. Oh, go on. Thank you, Rob. Um, yeah, I to tell you what, it'd be quite a tribute if you changed your name in, 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 in gratitude, but I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll take the compliment. What did oh. you want to... What did you want to say? Everything is possible. <laughs> Back in 2016, my local pub, they had a Brexit party mm. the night after the referendum. Uh, free shots for everybody that voted Brexit. Um, mm. My wife and I kindly declined, yes. along with a couple of the others. 
and there was be- bewilderment there. Um, there was 50-year-old men that had voted for the first time. Mm. And one by one, I've spoke to them over the last two or three years, not arguing, just asking what's good about Brexit, yeah. what they don't like about the EU, and just sowing the seed of doubt. And I'd like to think they've gone back to their normal position now and not bothered voting. It won't help in a referendum, but it's a vote less. And well, the turnout... I think supports your position. The two main parties shed a total of 27,566 votes. So, I, I mean, for you to suggest that people decided to stay at home for whatever reason is pretty hard to argue with. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's grim news for both of them, albeit that one of them emerges as the victor. And you're confident that they, they, they don't vote at all rather than... Well, I, I, the, I'm, the, the, I'm the, the constituency confident. you're talking about, the, the people who've always felt politically disengaged, were, were whipped up into r- righteous indignation at all of these perceived slights that the European Union was inflicting upon us. And if I've understood you correctly, you're suggesting that over the course of the last three years, they've realised at least up to a point that, that it was nonsense. Ab- absolutely. In fact, uh, some of them were surprised at the uh, recent MEP elections. They, they thought we were already out of Europe. Oh, bless them. Um, Anything to learn from this on the national stage, do you think, Rob? I'm not sure. I did expect a more robust response from Jeremy Corbyn after the, the um, Euro elections, um, more pro-referendum. But I can see now that he, he couldn't do that until after Peterborough. Oh, well, you say um, you think there might be movement now? I, I think it's, it's, it's more likely now. Peterborough's been secured, and I don't think he'd have won Peterborough. Oh, OK. God, yeah, but I tell you what, the first two callers today have done a better job than me. I hope management aren't listening. <laughs> no, not at all, but no, th- thanks for taking my call. Oh, you're very uh, welcome. Thank you for your thank you, thank you for your help and a few facts and figures that hopefully convince people to stay at home rather than vote Brexit. Well, yeah, next stage is to get them out and vote for facts and figures rather than fear and, uh, and, and lies, but still, uh, you know, we'll take whatever we can in the current climate. 27 minutes after 10. Thank you, Rob. My apologies for calling you, James. What a l- ludicrous slur. Um, a couple of phone lines free. And the question is really very, very open today. It's as broad as you want it to be. What, you, what do you think we can learn from yesterday's result in Peterborough? I, I just on a purely, if you could set aside all positions and prejudices and policies and beliefs, for the bookies to get it so wrong is fascinating. But anything that I would have said three or four years ago, um, anything I would have described as really important and significant, has ceased to be so. Because everything has changed. Large parts of our democracy have been broken by the popularity of things that aren't true, by the number of people persuaded to vote because they thought that we were going to be overcome by Turkish refugees or something. It's, it's, It's madness. You can't... And this is what's so interesting about watching the Conservative Party in what may prove to be... a a form of death throes is that they rode that tiger. Uh, Conservative Brexiters were prepared to get into bed with some of the vilest people we've ever seen in public life in this country because their ideological enslavement to Brexit was so complete and so cultish and now they are reaping what they sowed. You can't ask liars to help you win a referendum without the liars hanging around and snapping at your heels after the referendum result has come in. And the Conservatives, I think, learned that lesson quite sharply in Peterborough yesterday, albeit that their third place, just a sort of two and a half thousand votes behind the Brexit party, from where I'm sitting, looks a lot better than they might have been expecting. Which just adds to the sense that it's almost impossible to derive meaningful analyses of the national political picture from what happened in Peterborough yesterday. The only thing you can say with any certainty at all is that Nigel Farage will run away when it's clear that he's not going to be able to make any victory speeches in front of the cameras. And secondly, he'll be invited into every studio in the country to argue that losing is actually winning in the same way that um, freedom is slavery and ignorance is strength. Uh, and before the day is out, someone on, on that side of British politics will be blaming the result on brown people. But I, I'm always slightly reluctant to, to share some of this stuff with you, but a story dropped just before we came on air, which is I mean, it's horrifying. It, it, there's a picture, really, that draws the attention first of two women covered in blood sitting on a bus, on a London bus. Um, and the report is, the account of the two women who, who were in a relationship, is that they were 
um, victims of a homophobic attack. A group of young men, four young men apparently, started asking them or demanding that they kiss each other uh, 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 while making crude sexual gestures. And when the young women quite rightly refused, um, they, they attacked us. Uh, the men who were in their 20s or 30s began throwing things and the couple told them to stop. This happened on Thursday, May the 30th, but the footage has just been released now. I, I, with great reluctance, because it's not going to be a happy hour or a happy experience. I, I, think, I think I'd like to know whether or not homophobic attacks... We spend a lot of time talking about the massive spike in racist attacks in the last three years. Uh, have homopho has homophobia become um, a little bit more mainstreamed as well? I suppose that leads us neatly back to the discussion about the Brexit Party's failure to win in Peterborough yesterday, uh, which is no doubt being chalked up as a resounding victory by the usual suspects. But for the rest of us, is there anything meaningful to learn from what happened in this strangest of by-elections? 03456060973. David is in Bristol. David, what can you tell us? I, James, I agree with you. I don't think we learned anything yesterday. <laughs> oh. Um, I think it just reinforces the broader picture of a, of a bankrupt democracy, really. And I think that what's been happening is since the 1970s, Europe has basically been saving ourselves, saving us from ourselves, and obscured how badly dysfunctional our democracy was becoming. And now, Do you see it? I, I don't become... see it. I'm glad we found an area of disagreement. I, I mean, I, I appreciate that, that austerity has been a, a, a big change in the major issues, but also, I don't think, does it go back to the 70s? I mean, we, we, we had conviction politics from, from 79 to 93, I, I did 97 onwards, Tony Blair brought in a, a fairly progressive agenda, the movement that was made on things like child poverty and education was, 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 was fairly powerful, so I, why, why do you trace the decline in democratic probity back to the 70s? Because I think that both of those examples that you've given illustrate how um, there doesn't have to be compromise if you've got a decent majority. So we've lost any right. idea of compromise. And I think that part of that is because the EU has actually saved us by um, doing two things. One, it's been uh, amazingly good at creating free market conditions for trade. Uh, incredible and, and, and the most sophisticated basis in, wor in the world, mm. uh, but also it's done that by protecting uh, and enhancing our personal economic um, uh, and personal freedoms. So we could, as a country, sort of knock around like on a pinball machine doing whatever we wanted to do. I see what you um, mean, yes, and uh, so we don't have, and, and that's when you see the polling and, and indeed the result yesterday, and you see it, it looks very European, oddly, doesn't it? It looks like we actually have some form of proportional representation in place, because three and a half parties, or t I mean, three and a half, yeah, three and yeah. a half parties could realistically be looking at those results and thinking, crikey lads, hang in there, we could, we could win this, we could, we could come away with the prize. Yeah, and it's only when we get to the point where we have then an exercise in direct, direct democracy, which is the referendum, that, uh, and combined with the resulting ineptitude of our political class, um, mm. I'm including Cameron, May, and Corbyn in this, yes. that you get, to, you get to a point where they, they can't actually mediate for us, which is, should be their role. Because they all um, have to try and keep too many people happy for too long, for too much of the time. Yeah, and, and what, when we had a 52%, 48% vote, their role, as I see it, was to say, OK, that was quite close. It's this pretty huge decision we've reached. How can we reach a position that um, suits or do, doesn't disgruntle uh, everybody but drive through on the basis that we need a compromise here? But because we've been in this dogmatically driven um, political environment and I'm, I'm including Blair within that because he had such a huge majority he didn't have to compromise, he could just do what he wanted to do, even though it was middle ground and progressive Yes, al although his most controversial act of course was undertaken with um, almost unanimous support of the Conservatives, in fact you've just reminded me, I meant to look up whether there were more Labour MPs or Conservative MPs who voted against the Iraq War, but um, but just to, just, to, just to put that out there, that is yeah. Like well, we, uh, no, we could, you know, and and 
we can all make mistakes. Even the best politicians can make mistakes, yeah. as, as can the best people. But um, so I wouldn't hold that over their heads too much. I think they were genuine in what they were, were trying to do. But when we get to that result, which is 4852, you, you need a political class that is capable of, of pushing something through. But then you get May, you know, ruining their own position by by achieving a, a remarkably inept performance in a minority government. Yeah. And you've got a variety of hard Brexiteers within that minority government driven by, you know, capitalist opportunism or dogmatic anti-Europeanism or, Racism. you know, the establishment um, power base that says we want well, to take back control. But weird, second, weird Second World War revivalism, which has rendered utterly ridiculous by the events of the last couple of days. Wasn't yeah, it to, I mean, to we, actually we, see the, the footage of German and, yeah. and, and British veterans embracing to see some of the some of the veterans interviewed talking about their despair at the thought of Europe breaking up again, and then idiots like Marc Francois popping up on the telly yeah. doing an impression of Captain Mannering. Yeah, and, and that's all reinforced by the social media environment as well, because things that people would only utter to themselves and shout at the radio, they now shout out on social media. And instead of they mates down the pub or the WI or whatever, telling them, ah, oh, don't be so daft, they've now got an audience of like-minded people and their view isn't mediated. So and Possibly not even you know, people. They get a hundred likes off a, from a troll factory in St. Petersburg and convince themselves that the, the, the position they've adopted, despite the fact that all of the evidence and facts would render it ridiculous, there's a hundred people there that like it, so it must be right. I made an even bolder but more chilling discovery about social media yesterday, which is it perfectly fits with David's analysis, which is there's now a very, very big um, constituency of accounts on there that block the person that they're talking about and block the people that they're talking about and presumably the political party that they're talking about. So it goes even more unchallenged than it would if the person, obviously my experience was based on me, accounts that have blocked me but talk about me constantly. And what the hell is that about if not enforcing precisely the sort of um, uh, fake news echo chamber that David refers to? Very, very strange. I'll tell you that for nothing. 10.42 is the time. He's probably right, isn't he? Uh, I don't know. Well, actually, I should ask you, David. What happens next then? Where, where, is there any light at the end of your tunnel? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a bit scared, really, because I think that there will be some sort of, you know, moment of of crisis, uh, and maybe your earlier caller who was talking about the sort of the, the facade being ripped away from from Trump and yes. and and the ambassador saying, you know, well, actually, the NHS is on the table, and all those drug deals that you do, we want a part of that, and you can't, you know, you're, you've, you've negotiated the price too too well. But if you just look at the, if we if we come out of Europe on a hard Brexit, if you look at the inequality of our bargaining position vis-a-vis uh -huh. um, -vis everybody else we've been negotiating with, you know. Yes, we could do with some better negotiators, no doubt. I mean, you know, we'd always do something that's better, but it ignores the total inequality of where we'd end up. In well, and, and, and the intractability of, of the withdrawal agreement. And, you know, it's, it's, it's as if they're just doing it again. They're doing what Theresa, the front runners are just doing what Theresa May did. But with that added, as you quite rightly point out, again, with that added frisson of the other thing that she animated, like, like Dr. Frankenstein attaching the electrodes to his monster when she said no deal is better than a bad deal, she created this ludicrous scenario in which... Dominic Raab is publicly contemplating somehow restoring parliamentary sovereignty by literally abandoning it. Thank you, David. Quality stuff. I think every caller today has done a better job than me. I, I, well, I bet none of you could do mystery hour. Joe's in Chelmsford. Joe, what would you like to say? Hi. Hello, Joe. Um, I just wanted to say that I completely agree with what David said and it's what good, you wasn't said. good, not Sorry, what? <laughs> Um, it's basically a straightforward decision between a party of compromise and a party of no compromise. The Brexit party and the ERG should form together with Dominic Raab, Farage, Lee Smog, all these people who think that they can deal, have, leave without a deal. And it's not about old party politics anymore. And then the other side, people like Rory Stewart, Andy McDonald, people across all parties who want a deal and work for this premise for now to get this resolved and then see what happens with the parties and it would be really interesting to see where Michael Gove and Boris Johnson align themselves because although they say they would leave without a deal, Boris Johnson does, actually Michael Gove is maybe more progressive and maybe Boris Johnson just wants the power. 
Maybe. Now, maybe. <laughs> maybe Boris Johnson just wants power. The only thing every single person yeah. in Britain can agree on is the fact that Boris Johnson makes every single decision based entirely on selfish reasons. So I, I don't yeah, think there's but, any maybe there. Maybe yeah. Gove is a progressive. I think that needs a maybe. Yeah, but, but the bottom line is what you're saying is completely right. It's just kamikaze Brexit. I'm a Remainer. I'm a Labour supporter. I'm from the North East. And I heard Andy McDonald's on your programme this morning. What a great guy. Rory Stewart in the Tories, what a great guy. The problem is it's a temporary holding position, isn't it? Because then you go yeah. back to traditional uh, splits, which would still be left-right about taxation, about public services, about public spending. Uh, you know, One Nation Toryism is um, I don't think, missing I don't think we will ever go back to traditional splits. Do you I not? Think that, no, because I, will, I voted Labour most of my life. I voted Lib Dem this year. First time my husband hasn't voted Conservative, he voted for change. Young people want to remain. I did a survey at my child's school, 84% of them wanted to remain. Yes. So it's not never going to be the same after this. But even if you voted to remain, which I did, we could do a better deal. We can't leave without a deal. And Dominic Raab... We couldn't do a better deal. We, well, we, the only circumstances in which we could do a better deal is if we put freedom of movement back on the table. I mean, this is presuming that they would allow us to try to renegotiate, but there's no way... Maybe so, but... You can't abolish freedom of movement without withdrawing no. from the single market and the customs union. That was the point at yeah. which everything fell apart. It was always going to. As soon as yeah. Theresa May committed to that, to keep sweet the people that have now absolutely humiliated and defenestrated her. That, I mean, that's the hubris here. She thought yeah. that by pandering to the far right of her own party, she'd protect both her position and her party, and it's ended up doing the precise opposite. The, cons the party's is, in free fall, and she resigns today. Yeah, and actually, you can see that the people who are no compromise, Brexit, no deal, intolerant, backward-looking agree on many things, put them together and everybody else work together to get a good deal which means we still Oh, or, and you, you're not saying this, but I will, or to call the whole thing off, um, which uh, surely has to be a more attractive prospect than continuing with this madness, or indeed crashing out in a kamikaze Brexit and spending the next ten years desperately trying to cobble together some form of trade agreements that, that would allow us to plug some of the hole. And what Joe highlights, of course, is, is the big miscalculation by May, and it's odd that she would have miscalculated this, although perhaps looking at her record in the Home Office not that odd, is that... that if you introduce racist lies to politics, it, it, it opens up a bottomless hole. This is the point. That hole is bottomless. You can never fill it. However much you throw into a hole that's been dug by racist liars, it will never, ever fill up again. So there's no way, once Theresa May thought that abolishing freedom of movement would keep everyone sweet, they just come back and ask for more. They never go, ah, oh, yes, excellent, because their whole project is built to be kind on either a, a, a misunderstanding or to be less kind upon a profound mistrust and dislike of people who aren't exactly like them. And you can never rationalise that. You can't reason people out of a hole that they haven't been reasoned into. I, I, I'm increasingly fascinated by it. I would love to spend an hour with Theresa May off the record and just ask what the hell she thought she was playing at. Uh, if I had to pick a, a, a slogan or, a, or a, a pithy description, I think Theresa May saw her job as damage limitation while being politically incapable of ever acknowledging that what we were doing was damaging. And you wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy. And to, just sort of by way of illustration, th this is astonishing, really, that we've allowed our country to be reduced to such a parlous state that... that, that people with no policies, no ideas, no knowledge, no understanding of anything are still riding very high in the polls despite doing badly in Peterborough yesterday. This is the candidate, the Brexit Party candidate, um, insisting that the European Union is, is somehow responsible for uh, determining our educational curriculum. A, a, a position of such, of such utter, utter idiocy. You wonder whether he can lace his own shoes unaided. You, you, you just hop around this country, just move from England to Scotland and you'll see completely different curricula, let alone hopping over the channel and, and, and comparing German to Spanish curricula. I mean, it's quite incredible, but it's so seductive and he clearly believes it, to be fair to the bloke. I, I, I think he's just 
a bit thick rather than actually being dishonest here. He clearly believes it because as soon as someone says to you, it's a bit like, I'm working on this theory, so bear with me a bit. It's fight or flight. If someone says to you there's a threat, then, then a certain type of person doesn't calculate the threat. They run or they swing. So if someone says to you, the EU is, is, is making all these rules, you'd think after three years of nobody being able to answer the question, which rules? You'd think people might have just felt a little bit of a, of a di dilution of their certainty that the European Union is imposing and inflicting all these rules on us. So this fellow, Mike Green, absolutely adamant that the European Union is dictating our education system. And then a, a decent journalist for once, in this case, um, Ollie Dugmore at joe.co.uk. And then this happens. But in the instance of education, it's the government in Westminster that sets the curriculum, it's the Department of Education, the EU. Within no European boundaries, EU boundaries. It was, okay, so what EU boundaries are there in the instance of education? It, it, it infiltrates every part of our, uh, of our business. I've probably got one more question, because okay. the guys are going over to Sure, it. sure. Okay, so we'll, we'll just go again then. Specifically, in education, you're saying it infiltrates every part of our education system. How? It, it, well, in education, uh, we, are, we are told what the, the, the sort of hours that kids should go to school. We're given what, how they should be fed in school. We're given what subjects they should do within school. We're increasingly being told how that is, should be monitored, tested, uh, and, and what exams they should do to, to some degree. But it's the, it's the national government that sets the curriculum, isn't it? You know, we're very compliant as a country. So what I see is that we comply with anything Europe, Europe says. If they suggest it, we tend to do it. Other countries tend to do their own thing and don't comply. And I think part of the problem is we're so compliant that if they suggest it, we do it. Could you provide an instance where the EU has insisted on something for our education system that we've then enacted on? No. No, not specifically, but I know it covers all of our areas, and I know when I've run businesses that if you let someone else set that, you then don't have the freedom to look at it yourself, and if you don't get the freedom to look at it yourself, you don't spend the money to, to build your own strategy, and I just know that when we look across all those areas, the degree to which I have got in it, there are so many areas that we're just better off out. <laughs> I, mean, I presume there are people listening to this who think the lad played a blinder there. <clears throat> Could you just name one example of this thing you're certain of? No. Not one. It's like Groundhog Day. That, that's my life there. That's my career there in, in microcosm. Could you just name, because you're absolute, and that was the day of the vote. This man was asking the people of Peterborough to put him in Parliament. Because, for example, the European Union dictates our education policy. Does it? No. How do I know that? Because you can't think of a single example to support your th thesis. Never mind, just wave your flags. <sighs> Doff cap, tug forelock, vote re smog, or not in this case. 21% showing for the, uh, for the Tories in Peterborough. I, can anyone make sense of that? 0345 973 Stuart's in Putney. Stuart, what would you like to say? Probably fall, <laughs> fallen asleep, has he? Helen is in Islington. Helen, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello. Thank you for your good sense and your well-informed comments, keeping us all sane, no, I think. You're very kind. Um, I suppose what we've learned from Peterborough is we need to have a discussion about what is democracy, because whenever I talk to a Brexiter, mm. they always say, ooh, democracy, it's a democratic, well, the people, we're being demo democratic. Yes. But in fact, it seems pretty clear that democracy, in this case, the vote, was bought. It was bought by Aaron Banks, by Cambridge Analytica, by Steve Bannon. But nobody thinks Dominic that their Cummings. nobody thinks their vote was bought. So even once we move to yeah. the position where no one can deny the manipulation, no one can deny yeah. the, um, uh, the the deceit or indeed the criminality, nobody thinks that it influenced them. That's the fascinating thing about it. Yes, and I wonder if that's a tolerance of the Conservative Party under Theresa May of what she knew was kind of manipulated and probably illegal. I mean, it's still being investigated now. Well, I, I don't. I mean, the chief executive, uh, uh, Johnson and, and Gove, were at the very top of the of yes. the organisation that is that has been found to have broken the law, and, and they're both, or they were until quite recently, both in the cabinet. I and mean, that is an astonishing thing to say out loud. But again, it's it, it just gets swept under the carpet in the current climate. Yeah, and that's shocking. It's like Banana Republic kind of dust. Yes. The day after the Brexit referendum, I met a woman in Norfolk who was delivering some horse manure to a friend of mine. Oh, yes. And she said, oh, isn't it crazy about Brexit? And I said, not really. Mm. She said, um, well, I'm a racist and I'm proud. Really? And I was like, uh huh? 
And then she said, I don't want 76 million Turks coming over here. Oh. So this is a person who obviously wasn't really interested in politics, but they'd been... Yes, but, there, but, but you see, you, you can't have it both ways. Forgive me. You, you know, you, you can talk about voter manipulation. She hasn't been yes. manipulated. She's a, she's a proud racist, and she's got her vote is worth just as much as yours, and you can't really have a democracy where it wouldn't be. That's true, but then this 76 million Turks thing was a story that was aimed at certain people, not me. I never saw it. It never popped up on no, my social no, media. No, that's, that's a very good so point. Although I, I think with Cambridge Analytica and Dominic Cummings. Didn't Johnson say um, he'd never mentioned Turkey? And then we found a clip of him talking very specifically <laughs> about Turkey. Again, something that yes. would have ended a career at one point. I like that fellow yesterday in Peterborough claiming... That, that, remember when Diane Abbott embarrassed herself on Nick's show and, and the, the world went nuts? What's the difference? I know she's a more senior politician and she's in office and she got some sums wrong. But that bloke, I mean, his, his trousers fell down in public. And doesn't matter, just gloss on, gloss over it, move on. What's the difference between a middle-aged white bloke and a, and a black woman, I wonder, in the eyes of some voters, possibly like your manure deliverer in Norfolk? The answer would be clear. And speaking of racists, here it is, as promised. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's unbelievable. I said that by the close of play today, somebody would be trying to blame it all on brown people. And here is one report of last night's events in Peterborough. Brexit party insiders said Labour's reliance upon a mainly Pakistani vote in inner city wards had been the difference between the parties. Uh, some of these houses had 14 people in them registered to vote. It would be interesting to see what proportion voted Labour. So there it is. Again, no pleasure from me in being proved completely right. But why would brown-skinned people have a problem with the Brexit party? I don't understand. They keep telling us that they're not racist at all. And yet there's a Brexit party person claiming that brown-skinned people would obviously have a problem with them. It's 11 o'clock. <laughs>